Good morning. Welcome. We're so glad that you're joining us on this Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. It's going to be a wonderful morning. I uh, just want to say welcome. Uh, if you're joining us for the first time, we're so glad that you're joining us virtually. Uh, and we believe that as we gather, God's going to meet us here. Let me give you guys a couple pieces before we get started. Number one, if you're on the whitbygrace.online.church uh, platform, you can look and you can see there's some material for kids under the kids tab, which is a lot of fun. Uh, Jennifer put together some really great stuff for the kiddos. There's a giving tab, there's a Facebook, and also other ways to connect. And there's the chat. So check out the chat. We want to make sure you guys are chatting with each other. Let everybody know you're here. Say good morning to everybody. And also, during any time during the service, you can put the uh, you can put a prayer request in, and you'll see a button for that. So please uh, request request prayer. Chat with everybody. Uh, this is a different kind of format, and we're excited to be together in this way and connect. You know, this week has been a really great week as we've been looking forward to Resurrection Sunday. And a few of us pastors were talking and we thought, you know, this could be a really cool moment when we're all in this together. All of the churches in Oak Harbor are being impacted. This could be a great moment uh, to do something together. And so all of us uh, read the Lord's Prayer and uh, this is what uh, Living Word helped put together. So thank you over at Living Word for this. And thank you for all the pastors for participating. Uh, we really sense that God is saying the whole city, all the churches in the city are one church. And today we get to celebrate who Jesus is. So enjoy this video. And then we're just going to jump right into some worship. So let me pray as we begin. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you, God, that you want to do something very special this morning in our hearts. Thank you for what you're doing in our city, even in the midst of crisis. And Lord, thank you for what you want to do in every heart, in every family, in every home this morning. So we thank you, Lord, for who you are. And we want to give all glory to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your will be done. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts and forgive our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. It's as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, and lead us not, lead us not, and lead us not, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, but deliver us from evil, but deliver us from evil, for yours is the kingdom, 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 and the power, and the glory, glory forever, Amen. 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 Amen.
That was awesome. Uh, thank you for that, Jacob. Uh, just so good to gather uh, together and worship. Uh, before we jump into the rest of the service, many of you know Brad Barshaw. Uh, he was the interim pastor here before I got here and just has become a very close friend and also just a real father in the faith here at Grace Community. And as we were chatting this week, uh, I just asked him if he would share a little bit from his heart about what God's speaking to him and some encouragement uh, for us here at Grace Community. So I thought, what better Sunday than Easter Sunday to have one of the fathers of the faith uh, here at Grace Community share. So uh, here's Brad Barshaw. Hey, hey, hey Grace family. Uh, this is Brad Barshaw. For those of you who remember me, as I was the interim pastor there, uh, just uh, calling to say aloha and uh, know I'm praying for you guys. Uh, rough, rough season. But um, there's a verse that sticks out in my mind. Um, talks about the tension we live in on this broken world. It's uh, in Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10. And it says, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Um, bottom line is, God wins. And I pray in the midst of the tears and the challenges and the isolation, um, a sense of hope, a sense of God's grace, uh, we've been able to connect with neighbors, uh, not social, <laughs> not close, but just saying hi and checking in, how they doing. And so there's opportunities all around us. And so I just don't want to say thank you for your faithfulness over the years. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of the family and still be a part of the family. Um, my blessing on Jake and the rest of the staff uh, and all of you. Uh, I'm praying that this would be a fruitful, fruitful season. Uh, love you guys. And again, appreciate you and your faithfulness out there. Excited about the new unity among 10 of the churches. And just uh, God's doing some very cool stuff. So may God bless you. And may your hope stay real and growing forward. Not without stumbling, but... If you stumble forward, <laughs> then you'll keep growing no matter what. Love you guys. Appreciate you. Aloha. Thanks for that, Brad. Um, really encouraging as always. Uh, and what a great, what a great message for us. Um, just may, I want to make a couple quick announcements before we, uh, before we continue. First of all, if you're wondering about giving here at Grace Community, there's three ways to give. You can give uh, through the mail. We have a secure mailbox. You can send that via mail. Uh, you can always give online at wouldbegrace.org. And that actually, the giving tab on the online platform will take you right there. And you can continue to give through your mobile device. And we just want to say thank you uh, for all of you that are continuing in your generosity. You know, there's a lot happening at Grace right now with all kinds of small groups running online, uh, all sorts of things happening. And the staff is making that happen. The staff is facilitating that along with a lot of amazing volunteers. And so we just want to thank you for supporting the mission of Grace Community as you give. Also, I just wanted to take note this past Good Friday, we spent a day in prayer and many people joined together in prayer. And I think that's one of the biggest things as a church we can learn to do during this time is begin to pray, spend more time in prayer, schedule prayer into our day. For many of us, our days are a little more flexible. And so I want to encourage you, schedule time for prayer. We had a great time on Friday praying through the Lord's Prayer uh, as we celebrated what Jesus has done for us. But as I was talking to Dan Caesar this week, he just had some real cool things that he's engaging in in prayer and ways that he is using prayer uh, and ways that he's growing in his prayer life. So before we get into the word, I just want to uh, take a moment and let Dan share with us. Good morning, Grace Community. I am talking to you live from Chelsea and I's house, and I just wanted to share a couple of ideas with you guys 
um, through everything that we're going through right now, um, the whole coronavirus and all this stuff happening, uh, kids at home, working, staying at home, um, not going out as much as we often would like to do. Uh, maybe that even means not going out for fast food and just having to eat at home. But um, Jake and I had talked a little bit about prayer, um, actually a lot about prayer, and he wanted me to just share a couple of ideas with you guys as far as how that has evolved for Chelsea and I um, since all of this has happened. Um, so homeschooling, working from home, um, trying to fit a 10 hour day into a regular day seems so hard when I'm actually doing it out of the living room or at the kitchen table and then have a first grader right across from me that does not want to be in school. Um, but uh, a couple of things that have gotten stronger for sure um, with Chelsea and I, um, we're able to actually connect in prayer. Um, so we're at least trying to do that on a regular basis where we're able to pray together, um, not only for um, just everything that's happening, but loved ones and um, people within the church that we hear of that need prayer, um, our community, um, just everything going on in the world. I don't think we could ever really fall short of things to pray for right now, um, but also just the praise that we're able to raise up to him, um, babies being born, friends coming together, um, families reunited, and just um, so many glorious things that we're able to still capture. Um, through everything that is happening. Um, it's amazing to be able to still spotlight um, just the beauty of what our Creator is still doing around us. Um, if anybody caught it the other night, there was a full moon and it was just amazing. Um, I know I was in the middle of a Zoom call with Howard and he uh, almost dropped his phone and him and Janice both were so excited to go outside and look at the full moon and um, that definitely didn't let me down. Um, so just taking in those smaller things, the smaller details um, has been one of those amazing things to be able to be praising for and praying for. Um, and then just our daily devotionals, um, our morning time um, has been able to take off quite a bit. Uh, one of the benefits obviously of working from home is that schedule is a little bit looser to where we are able to spend maybe a little bit more time in our devotionals and then get ready for work. Um, so I just wanted to pray for Jake and for the sermon today um, before I let you all go. But um, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for um, being able to still meet in the midst of all of this, regardless of what is trying to keep us apart, Lord. I thank you so much that you are able to keep us connected. Um, I just ask that as we're going through these hard times, um, that we are reminded of all the glory that you're bringing before us, the peace that you still grant us, um, and just who really is in control. Lord, I thank you so much that you are that um, that regardless of how I'm in all of this, um, you do have control. And I thank you so much for that, Lord. Um, I just ask that you be with Jake um, as he delivers his message, um, that you speak through him today, um, and that those that need to hear something, that their ears are open, um, their hearts are ready, and their minds are um, ready to just hear everything that you have to deliver, Lord. Um, I thank you, I praise you, um, and I pray all this in your glorious name. Amen. So Grace Community, I just pray for you. Um, I pray that everything is going well, and I just hope that you have a great service, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for that, Dan. Uh, like Dan said, we're going to get into the Word this morning and just really excited to celebrate Easter Sunday. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. And 
really it fits right into our series. It all started on Sunday, which really is referencing Jesus' resurrection. You know, it really does matter how we start. How we start matters. I grew up as a swimmer, and the number one thing you could do is have a good start. You know, jumping off those blocks, sometimes you'd come in and you'd almost belly flop, and by the time you're coming out of the water, uh, getting into your stroke, people are way ahead, and you've already lost the race. I remember growing up, and my dad uh, decided we'd take this big road trip, and within a short time on the road, we started smelling gas, and we thought one of our gas lines was leaking, and so the nearest place to fix it was actually about a 16-hour drive away from us, and so my dad drove all night to get there just to realize that he'd accidentally overfilled the gas tank. Oops. How you start matters. It can change the whole trajectory of how a trip goes. You know, um, premarital counseling is one of those things that really matters. Did you know that there's a 30% greater chance of marital success if people do premarital counseling? Isn't that amazing? It's just one of those statistics uh, that shows how we start makes a difference. You know, many of us are starting on a new journey starting this week. Uh, at the beginning of the week, the governor uh, let us know, parents, that school uh, will not be meeting physically for the rest of the year. And so as a parent, I'm sitting here saying, oh boy, I'm starting on a new journey of homeschooling. And although we have great teachers who are supplementing what we're doing, all of a sudden we have a new challenge and a new marathon. And so we're looking at how do we start this out right? How do we start out right so that at the end of the school year, we can say, oh yeah, our kids made good pro progress. We're just at the beginning. The series, it all starts on Sunday is focusing on how we start. Last week, we talked about coming out of the crowd. It all starts with us coming out of the crowd and saying, Jesus, I want to follow you. And as we're focused on the resurrection this morning, the good news of who Jesus is, what we're talking about this morning is it starts with the gospel. It starts with Jesus. We're going to be focused on 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. And 1 Corinthians 15 is an interesting passage because, and most people don't really realize this, but 1 Corinthians 15 is the earliest written account that we have of the Easter story, of the testimony of Jesus' resurrection. It's a very brief account, but it's a number of years earlier in terms of written accounts. You see, the, uh, the early Christians were all verbal or oral in the way they communicated the gospel. It wasn't until many years later that they said, we need to write all this down. Now, it's also interesting that this 1 Corinthians 15 contains what many scholars believe is a creed, and they can trace that creed all the way back to three years after Jesus' resurrection. It's the earliest source we have of the story, of the simple facts, the historical facts of Jesus' resurrection. So as we go into this second part of it all started on Sunday, we're going to the point where truly a new creation started for all of us who believe. And I believe a new creation could start in you today as Jesus works in your life. It's all about Jesus. And it all started on a very special Sunday, almost 2,000 years ago. So let's pray and get into the scripture this morning. Lord, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that you want to speak to each one of us. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that uh, your gospel has the power to change lives. And what you did on the cross, Lord, changed history forever. So, Lord, even in our own lives, would you just do something miraculous today by your spirit in each one of us? Lord, would you change the trajectory of our life? The Lord, even as we look at our lives, we could say, I remember that Sunday. It all started on that Sunday, Lord. And it can all start for us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's start in 1 Corinthians verse 1. Now, this is Paul writing uh, to the Corinthian church and expressing to them 
what they stand upon. Really, the starting point for who they are and who they're called to be. He says this in verse 1 of chapter 15. I make known to you, brethren, the gospel, which literally means good news. The good news, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, that's referring to the half-brother of Jesus, James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. You know, those early believers, after the resurrection, they had witnessed something absolutely amazing and they spread out all over the known world to share the good news of what Jesus had done. That this truly was the Son of God who had given his life, had died and was buried and rose from the dead and what the meaning of that would be to those who believed. And they go all over the known world sharing that with everyone they can and, it, and the gospel makes it to Corinth. And here's these believers early on in a culture that has no reference points for who Jesus is, for the resurrection. There's no reference points. And Paul says, here's where it starts. It all started on that Sunday. You know, what we're talking about this morning is that as we face this unprecedented time, I've talked to people who have been around a lot longer than me, and everyone's saying we've never faced this type of a challenge before in this COVID-19 outbreak. We've never faced this in this way. As we face this unprecedented time, we're called to start at the same point those first disciples began almost 2,000 years ago. It hasn't changed. It all started on Sunday for them with the resurrection. And it all starts for us at the same place. So as we get into this scripture this morning, I want to talk about three starting points that Paul talks about in this scripture. Three starting points and how that can shape us and that can help us walk out the transformational journey of following Jesus. Paul starts out by saying, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which you are saved, if you hold fast the word I preached. For unless you believed in, in vain, for I delivered to you as first importance what I received, that Christ died for sinners according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Right there, Paul speaks to them a very simple starting point. This isn't complex. A child can understand the good news. The good news is that while I was still a sinner, God became man in Jesus Christ. He died for me, for the forgiveness of sins. He was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, conquering over death and sin. And now, to those who believe, we can be saved. We can receive the forgiveness of sins and we can receive eternal life. It's as simple as that. And Paul is saying it starts with that. It starts with the gospel. A very simple truth. He just says three very simple things that change the world. Jesus Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead. You see, those first disciples didn't form a theology and then put it on to Jesus. They experienced the empty tomb. They saw Jesus. They felt him. He was 
physical. He physically was resurrected. They saw the wounds. Their theology was formed by a radical, life-altering, history-changing event. Maybe you've had something happen in your life in which everything changed after that. I remember as a kid, my dad would talk about how he grew up in West Virginia. And he would talk about this hot dog place. And he'd say, son, you have not tasted a real hot dog till you go to this hot dog place, this hole in the wall in rural West Virginia, and they make what's called slaw dog, all right? A slaw dog is a hot dog that has this kind of chili mix plus coleslaw on top. Now, you might be saying to yourself right now, oh, I don't know about that. But those of you that have had it, you know what I mean. And I remember I finally got to that point where I went to that hole in the wall place with the secret recipe for the slaw dog and I ate that slaw dog and I had this experience of the slaw dog. And from that point forward, it became very clear why my dad had talked about that however many decades later because it changed my whole perspective of hot dogs. And since that moment, I keep trying to find that next slaw dog. So if you love slaw dogs, you've got a recipe. Uh, love if you would share that with me. In fact, uh, funny story, we got the secret recipe from the place. So now I can reproduce the slaw dogs. But it's interesting how that experience changed everything. This is what happened to them. They saw Jesus. They saw him hang on the cross. They saw the tomb. They saw the empty tomb. And they felt Jesus. They had an experience that changed them forever. They experienced the good news. These statements, Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose from the dead. Those are factual, experiential statements. These people experienced this. Paul goes on to talk about those eyewitnesses. There was up to 500 that saw him. And you could go and talk to these people. This was the experience of the good news. And Paul's saying, you can stand on the gospel. Think about this. If God became one of us, died for my sins, and rose from the dead, the implications of that are huge. The implications of that are huge. Number one, that God loved me enough to do that for me. That's good news. Number two, that my sins, which so easily entangle me, if Jesus could conquer over those things for me, by his spirit, I can have victory too. That's insanely huge. And the biggest thing of all, and this comes straight out of John 3.16, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus conquered over death. Death is not the final answer. Even as we look at this COVID-19 outbreak, death is not the final answer. We have no fear of death. Now, we want to be wise and honor people, honor vulnerable people that are in their health. We don't have any fear of death. We're not afraid because we know there's eternal life, and we want every single person to know the good news. This is where it starts for all of us. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're saying, you know what? I've heard that story. I've heard that. Or maybe I'm hearing it for the first time now, and that seems like a very simple story. How can that change my life? It all starts with you saying, I'm going to put my faith in that man, in that person. I'm going to put my faith in God and I'm going to trust him that yes, he died for you and you and you, but he also, he died for my sins. It becomes very personal. It starts with you accepting the good news of the gospel. It starts with the gospel. And then Paul goes on to say this, I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul is making his appeal to the word of God. He's saying, look, it all starts with the gospel and, it, and the word of God has pointed to this gospel. The word of God points to this gospel good news. If you want to know who Jesus is, start with God's word. It starts with the gospel. It starts with God's word. You know, when I talk to people about the Bible who 
maybe are skeptical or just don't really know what the Bible's all about, I get two questions. And the first question is, how can you trust this? Paul is making his appeal, saying, look, according to the scriptures, Jesus, it was predicted, prophesied, that Jesus would do this. Do you know that in the Old Testament, there is 191 references to what Jesus would do? Predictions, prophecies, made hundreds of years, hundreds of years before Jesus lived. These things couldn't have been written back into Jesus' life. It's not like anyone could have said, okay, let's create this character that fits these prophecies. No, that couldn't have happened that way. The way it all worked in time and in even what happened at the crucifixion, what was recorded by, by historians in the Gospels. Let me just give you a few. These are just 15, and these 12 of these 15 come from one scripture in Isaiah 53, 2 through 12. Isaiah predicted multiple aspects of Jesus' death and resurrection without mentioning Jesus' name. But listen to this. In just those scriptures, it was predicted that the Messiah would be rejected, was a man of sorrow, lived a life of suffering, was despised by others, carried our sorrow, was smitten and afflicted by God, was pierced for our transgressions, was wounded for our sins, suffered like a lamb, died with the wicked. Jesus was crucified with thieves, was sinless, prayed for others. Jesus prayed for those that crucified him from the cross. His hands and feet would be pierced. That's from Psalm 22. His side would be pierced, Zechariah 12. And that there would be lots cast for his garments, Psalm 22. There is no comparison to any other book that people claim have authority in this life. We believe that God's word was written by people who were inspired by the Spirit, inspired by God to write down things. And we can see that miraculously, what they wrote hundreds of years applied to Jesus. And I'm telling you something, the word of God applies to your life today. It starts with God's word. I always tell people, if you've never read anything from the Bible, read the Gospel of John. It's one of the accounts of Jesus by one of the disciples that was closest to him. And you'll get to see who Jesus is. I remember sitting with someone who never read the Bible before and we were walking through the Gospels together. And he said, I never knew Jesus said that. I never knew Jesus did this. I had a totally different view of Jesus. But now I can see who he is. And that man gave his life to Christ later. It started with the word of God. Now, the other question I get is not just can I trust it, but what do I need to do? How do I walk this out? And that really is the operative word. You know, growing up, I had wonderful parents who read me the Bible, but I didn't know what it meant to live that by faith. Matthew 7, Jesus is talking about the house built on rock versus the house built on sand. And he says this, he says, those who hear my words and put them into action, do them or put them into practice, those are the ones whose house is built on the rock. Or that is like the man who built his house on the rock. Isn't that interesting? It's not just about hearing, it's about doing. The challenge is to hear and obey. If you remember in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, after Jesus rose from the dead and he gave this encouragement or commission to his disciples to go and make disciples of all the nations, one of the things he said to them is teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. It starts with the word of God, hearing and obeying. One of the things that's encouraging me the most about this outbreak is that people are getting into their word. People are reading their word. How incredible is that? People are saying, what do I do? Maybe I could start with the word of God. Let me say, say this to you. If you're listening to this right now and you don't know Jesus yet, okay, don't, you don't need to go do an internet search. Start with God's word. Read the gospel. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
four different accounts of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Confirmed in 1 Corinthians 15, these simple details expanded and confirmed who Jesus is, what he's done, that that tomb was empty. And when you read those, you will see this is not mythology. This is not some story. This, these are eyewitness accounts that we can read together. And then we have the choice. Do we live it or not? One of my favorite quotes is from G.K. Chesterton. He says this, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and not tried. And I think that goes for all of us. As we follow Jesus, let's say, God, I want to hear your word and I want to obey it. What is God asking us to do during this time? As we read the word, what is God speaking to each one of us? And will we obey? Now is the time to start with God's word. We start with the gospel, the good news. Everyone needs to know. And it's according to the scriptures. Here then is how we live. Paul goes on to say in verse 5, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom remain until now, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. I love that, okay? Paul goes through the resurrection account. Jesus rose from the dead. The tomb was empty. Peter met him there. Then later, later, all the disciples were gathered and Jesus reveals himself to them. Then it says over 500 and some of them are still alive. You think about this for a second. It'd be one thing if I told you, you know what? Jesus rose from the dead. But I, I've never heard anybody else say that. Paul was saying, look, you can go check with these people. A bunch of them are still living. Paul doesn't name names, but you know he could. He was talking about people that saw, experienced, that Jesus revealed himself to. They saw him. They experienced him. But I love what he says in the end. He says, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. He's saying, look, I wish I would have got to walk with him. The word he uses there actually is the word for miscarriage. It's like I was born at the wrong time. I was born at the wrong time. I didn't get to experience him and walk with him. But he says he appeared to me also. Paul was the one who says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Paul had a, such an incredible encounter with Jesus. It changed him forever. He didn't get to walk with him as those other apostles did. Jesus appeared, revealed himself to Paul. That word appeared means to perceive through experience. Paul experienced Jesus. You can read the account of his conversion in the book of Acts, where Paul is walking along the road and he meets Jesus, the risen Christ, the one he's been persecuting. He has been trying to stamp out this false rumor that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And he meets Jesus. You know how many skeptics through the years have set out to stamp out this false rumor, this false notion that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And many of them, as they're seeking the truth, they meet the truth and they find out it is not a proposition. It is a person. They find out that they can have a relationship with this person. It starts with the gospel of who Jesus is, what he's done. It starts with the word. How then do we live? And it starts with revelation. God desires to reveal himself to you. God desires to know you. This is the whole reason God came. This is the reason God became flesh in Jesus Christ, so that we might know him. We might understand his love, that we might reach out and grasp for him, that we might seek him. God, if you love me enough to send your only son to die for me, I want to know you. I want to know the love that surpasses all knowledge. Here is my challenge for you during this time. If you have not yet 
have that encounter with God. And friends, it could be quiet. It could be loud. Mine was radical. Mine was radical. I was laying on a table, crying out to God for mercy, feeling a deep, such a deep fear and, connect, and conviction of sin. Maybe yours is going to be quiet, but it will be a bona fide encounter. You will be able to say, I know God. I know God. I don't have the timetable for you. I don't know how that will happen and when that will happen. But if you seek him with your whole heart. And this was Paul. Paul was murdering Christians. Yet in his heart, he wanted to please God. He was ignorant. But in his heart, he wanted the real thing. He didn't want a proposition. He was living according to the laws and the propositions of the Jewish faith. What he needed was a revelation of the living God. We serve a living God, a God who was buried and rose from the dead. We serve a living God. And this very day, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can encounter you. In just a moment, we're going to celebrate the resurrection together by taking communion. Communion is a picture of what Jesus has done for me. That if I take the bread, that's his body broken for me, that symbol, and that I take that juice and that symbol of his blood shed for me, and I do it in remembrance of him, what he's done for me. Jesus Christ, you died for me. You broke your body and then you rose from the dead. And I do this in remembrance of you. So in just a moment, we're going to do that. And uh, Aaron Stagg, uh, one of our worship guys, just felt led to take a video of him singing a song that had to do with Easter. And we're, gonna, we're going to be uh, listening and singing along uh, with him in just a moment. But as we do that, maybe... God wants to reveal himself to you. You know, from your home, you can grab some bread, some cracker, some juice. If you don't have any grape juice, not a problem. Not a problem. I don't think God is worried about grape juice. That's what they had at that moment. It's a great picture of his blood. But you could grab, uh, you know, anything and just say, Lord, I'm going to remember you in this moment. So in just a moment, we're going to go to that song. And remember what Jesus has done and take communion together all over this community. And some of you guys are even further than this community. You're outside the community watching. You can take communion with us right now and you can reflect and ask God to reveal himself to you as we enjoy this song. Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that you would meet with us in this moment. God, that we could be with you, Lord, as we take communion together in Jesus' name. Amen.
A special time to be together and worship him before we close i want to encourage you about a couple things number one if you're struggling uh, you have any needs could be groceries food that type of need uh, reach out to help at whidbygrace.org um, that's the web the uh, email rather we've set up and so please reach out if you know of a need or you have a need help at whidbygrace.org and then also, uh, we just want to continue to encourage you, reach out to people this week. Um, if you're worried someone is not being connected with, maybe you're saying, hey, I don't have their number or I'd love to connect with them, please uh, contact our office, contact at whidbegrace.org, um, and we want to help you connect. Uh, this is really something that we're trying to uh, continue to do, and it's going to be a marathon, but we're going to walk this together. And also, I want to encourage you with this. If you have a prayer request, you can always send that as well to contact at whidbegrace.org. And we want to continue to pray. Our prayer team is going to be continuing to pray during this time. And we want to join with you in prayer as well. And also, as always, I want just to encourage you to connect to any of our small groups through the Zoom app. That we have going. You can see online uh, there. You can go to connect and connect there. So Lord, as we close, we thank you for this wonderful time to celebrate your resurrection. And we believe, God, that you have great things ahead of us, or ahead for us, rather. And Lord, uh, help us to continue to grow, continue to stand on the gospel, to live according to your word, and to seek to know you more. In Jesus' name, amen.